Chapter 90 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 90. What was passing near the Bastille while Chicot was paying his debt to Y de Mayenne? It was eleven at night, and the Duc d'Anjou was waiting impatiently at home for a messenger from the Duc de Guise. He walked restlessly up and down, looking every minute at the clock. All at once he heard a noise in the courtyard, and thinking it was the messenger, he ran to the window. But it was a groom leading up and down a horse which was waiting for its master, who almost immediately came out. It was Bussy who, as captain of the duke's guards, came to give the password for the night. The duke, seeing this handsome and brave young man, of whom he had never had reason to complain, experienced an instant's remorse, but on his face he read so much joy, hope, happiness, that all his jealousy returned. However, Bussy, ignorant that the duke was watching him, jumped into his saddle and rode off to his own hotel, where he gave his horse to the groom. There he saw Remy. Ah, you, Remy. Myself, monsieur. Not yet in bed? I have just come in, indeed, since I have no longer a patient. It seems to me that the days have forty-eight hours. Are you, Anue? I fear so. Then Gertrude is abandoned. Perfectly. You grew tired. Of being beaten. That was how her love showed itself. And does your heart not speak for her tonight? Why tonight? Because I would have taken you with me. To the Bastille? Yes. You are going there? Yes. And Monsoreau? is at Compiègne, preparing a chase for the king. Are you sure, monsieur? The order was given publicly this morning. Ah, well, Jourdain, my sword. You have changed your mind? I will accompany you to the door for two reasons. What are they? Firstly, lest you should meet any enemies. Bussy smiled. Oh, mon Dieu, I know you fear no one, and that Remy the doctor is but a poor companion. Still, two men are not so likely to be attacked as one. Secondly, because I have a great deal of good advice to give you. Come, my dear Remy, come. We will speak of her, and next to the pleasure of seeing the woman you love, I know none greater than talking of her. Bussy then took the arm of the young doctor, and they set off. Remy, on the way, tried hard to induce Bussy to return early, insisting that he would be more fit for his duel on the morrow. Bussy smiled. Fear nothing, said he. Ah, my dear master, tomorrow you ought to fight like Hercules against Antaeus, like Theseus against the Minotaur, like Bayard, like something Homeric, gigantic, impossible. I wish people to speak of it in future times as the combat par excellence, and in which you had not even received a scratch. Be easy, my dear Remy, you shall see wonders. This morning I put swords in the hands of four fencers, who during eight minutes could not touch me once, while I tore their doublets to pieces. So conversing they arrived in the Rue Saint Antoine. Adieu, here we are, said Bussy. Shall I wait for you? Why? to make sure that you will return before two o'clock, and have at least five or six hours sleep before your duel. If I give you my word... Oh, that will be enough. Bussy's word is never doubted. You have it, then. Then adieu, monsieur. Adieu, Remy. Remy watched and saw Bussy enter, not this time by the window, but boldly through the door which Gertrude opened for him. Then Remy turned to go home, but he had only gone a few steps when he saw coming towards him five armed men wrapped in cloaks. When they arrived about ten yards from him, they said good night to each other, and four went off in different directions, while the fifth remained stationary. Monsieur de Saint Luc, said Remy. Remy! Remy in person! Is it an indiscretion to ask what your lordship does at this hour so far from the Louvre? Ma foi! I am examining, by the king's order, the physiognomy of the city. He said to me, St. Luke, walk about the streets of Paris, and if you hear anyone say I have abdicated, contradict him. 
and have you heard it nowhere and as it is just midnight i have met no one but monsieur de monsoreau i have dismissed my friends and am about to return monsieur de monsoreau yes you met him with a troop of armed men ten or twelve at least impossible why so he ought to be at Campiegne. he ought to be but he is not but the king's order bah who obeys the king did he know you i believe so you were but five my four friends and i and he did not attack you on the contrary he avoided me which astonished me as on seeing him i expected a terrible battle where was he going to the rue de la tissanderie ah mon dieu what monsieur de saint luc a great misfortune is about to happen to whom to monsieur de bussy bussy speak remy i am his friend you know oh monsieur de bussy thought him at Campiegne. well and profiting by his absence is with madame de monsoreau ah do you not see he has had suspicions and has feigned to depart that he might appear unexpectedly ah it is the duc d'anjou's doing i believe have you good lungs remy corbleu like a blacksmith's bellows well let us run you know the house yes go on then and the young men set off like hunted deer is he much in advance of us said remy about a quarter of an hour if we do but arrive in time end of chapter ninety recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter ninety one of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter ninety one. The Assassination. Bussy himself, without disquietude or hesitation, had been received by Diana without fear, for she believed herself sure of the absence of Monsieur de Monsoreau. Never had this beautiful woman been more beautiful, nor Bussy more happy. She was moved, however, by fears for the morrow's combat now so near, and she repeated to him again and again the anxiety she felt about it and questioned him as to the arrangements he had made for flight. To conquer was not all. There was afterwards the king's anger to avoid, for it was not probable that he would ever pardon the death or defeat of his favorites. "'And then,' said she, "'are you not acknowledged to be the bravest man in France?' Why make it a point of honor to augment your glory? You are already superior to other men, and you do not wish to please any other woman but me, Louis. Therefore, guard your life, or rather, for I think there is not a man in France capable of killing you, Louis. I should say, take care of wounds, for you may be wounded. Indeed, it was through a wound received in fighting with these same men that I first made your acquaintance. Make yourself easy, said Bussy, smiling. I will take care of my face. I shall not be disfigured. Oh, take care of yourself altogether. Think of the grief you would experience if you saw me brought home, wounded and bleeding, and that I should feel the same grief on seeing your blood. Be prudent, my too courageous hero, that is all I ask. Act like the Roman of whom you read to me the other day. Let your friends fight. Aid the one who needs it most, but if three men, if two men attack you, fly. You can turn like Horatius and kill them one after another. Yes, my dear Diana. Oh, you reply without hearing me, Louis. You look at me and do not listen. But I see you, and you are beautiful. Do not think of my beauty just now, mon dieu. It is your life I am speaking of. Stay. I will tell you something that will make you more prudent. I shall have the courage to witness this duel. You? I shall be there. Impossible, Diana. No, listen. There is, in the room next to this, a window. 
looking into a little court, but with a side view of the tournelle. Yes, I remember. The window from which I threw crumbs to the birds the other day. From there I can have a view of the ground. Therefore, above all things, take care to stand so that I can see you. You will know that I am there, but do not look at me, lest your enemy should profit by it. And kill me while I had my eyes fixed upon you. If I had to choose my death, Diana, that is the one I should prefer. Yes, but now you are not going to die, but live. And I will live. Therefore, tranquilize yourself, Diana. Besides, I am well seconded. You do not know my friends. Antrog uses his sword as well as I do. Riverrock is so steady on the ground that his eyes and his arms alone seem to be alive, and Livoreau is as active as a tiger. Believe me, Diana, I wish there were more danger, for there would be more honor. Well, I believe you, and I smile and hope, but listen and promise to obey me. Yes, if you do not tell me to leave. It is just what I am about to do. I appeal to your reason. Then you should not have made me mad. No, nonsense, but obedience. That is the way to prove your love. Order, then. Dear friend, you want a long sleep. Go home. Not already. Yes, I am going to pray for you. Pray now, then. As he spoke, a pane of the window flew into pieces. Then the window itself, and three armed men appeared on the balcony while a fourth was climbed over. This one had his face covered with a mask, and held in his right hand a sword, and in his left a pistol. Bussy remained paralyzed for a moment by the dreadful cry uttered by Diana at this sight. The masked man made a sign, and the three others advanced. Bussy put Diana back and drew his sword. "'Come, my brave fellows!' said a sepulchral voice from under the mask. "'He is already half dead with fear!' "'You are wrong,' said Bussy. "'I never feel fear.' Diana drew near him. "'Go back, Diana,' said he, but she threw herself on his neck. "'You will get me killed,' said he, and she drew back. "'Ah,' said the masked man, "'it is Monsieur de Bussy, and I would not believe it, fool that I was. Really, what a good and excellent friend. He learns that the husband is absent, and has left his wife alone in fear she may be afraid. So he comes to her company, although on the eve of a duel, I repeat.' He is a good and excellent friend. Ah, it is you, Monsieur de Montsoreau, said Bussy. Throw off your mask. I will, said he, doing so. Diana uttered another cry. The comte was as pale as a corpse, but he smiled like a demon. Let us finish, Monsieur, said Bussy. It was very well for Homer's heroes, who were demigods, to talk before they fought, but I am a man. Attack me, or let me pass. Monsoreau replied by a laugh which made Diana shudder, but raised Bussy's anger. "'Let me pass!' cried he. "'Ho, ho, ho! Then draw and have done. I wish to go home, and I live far off.' During this time, two other men mounted into the balcony. Two and four make six, said Bussy. "'Where are the others?' "'Waiting at the door.' Diana fell on her knees, and in spite of her efforts, Bussy heard her sobs. "'My dear Comte,' said he, "'you know I am a man of honor. "'Yes, you are, and Madame is a faithful wife.' "'Good, Monsieur, you are severe, but perhaps it is deserved. "'Only, as I have a prior engagement with four gentlemen, "'I beg to be allowed to retire tonight, "'and I pledge my word you shall find me again, when and where you will.' Monsoreau shrugged his shoulders. I swear to you, monsieur, said Bussy, that when I have satisfied monsieurs Quellis, Schomberg, Depernon, and Maugiron, I shall be at your service. If they kill me, your vengeance will be satisfied, and if not... Monsoreau turned to his men. On, on, my brave fellows, said he. Oh, said Bussy, I was wrong. It is not a duel, but an assassination. Yes. We were each deceived with regard to the other, but remember, monsieur, that the Duc d'Anjou will avenge me. It was he who sent me. Diana groaned. Instantaneously, Bussy overturned the prie-dieu, 
drew a table towards him and threw a chair over all, so that in a second he had formed a kind of rampart between himself and his enemies. This movement had been so rapid that the ball fired at him from the arquebus only struck the prix -dieu. Diana sobbed aloud. Bussy glanced at her and then at his assailants, crying, Come on, but take care, for my sword is sharp. The men advanced, and one tried to seize the prix -dieu, but before he reached it, Bussy's sword pierced his arm. The man uttered a cry and fell back. Bussy then heard rapid steps in the corridor, and thought he was surrounded. He flew to the door to lock it, but before he could reach it, it was opened, and two men rushed in. "'Ah, dear master!' cried a well-known voice. "'Are we in time?' "'Remy!' "'And I!' cried a second. "'It seems they are attempting assassination here.' "'Saint Luke!' cried Bussy joyfully. "'Ha, <laughs> ha, Monsieur de Montsoreau! I think now you will do well to let us pass, for if you do not, we will pass over you.' Three more men!' cried Montsoreau, and they saw three new assailants appear on the balcony. "'They are an army!' cried St. Luke. "'Oh, God protect him!' cried Diana. "'Wretch!' cried Montsoreau, and he advanced to strike her. Bussy saw the movement. Agile as a tiger, he bounded on him and touched him in the throat, but the distance was too great. It was only a scratch. Five or six men rushed on Bussy, but one fell beneath the sword of St. Luke. Remy, cried Bussy, carry away Diana. Montsoreau uttered a yell and snatched a pistol from one of the men. Remy hesitated. But you, said he, away, away, I confide her to you. Come, madame, said Remy. Never, I will never leave him. Remy seized her in his arms. Bussy, help me, Bussy, cried Diana for any one who separated her from Bussy seemed an enemy to her. Go, Bussy cried, I will rejoin you. At this moment Montsoreau fired and Bussy saw Remy totter and then fall, dragging Diana with him. Bussy uttered a cry and turned. It is nothing, master, said Remy. It was I who received the ball. She is safe. As Bussy turned, three men threw themselves on him. St. Luke rushed forward, and one of them fell. Two others drew back. St. Luke, cried Bussy, by her you love, save Diana. But you? I am a man. St. Luke rushed to Diana, seized her in his arms, and disappeared through the door. Here, my men, from the staircase, shouted Montsoreau. Ah, coward, cried Bussy. Montsoreau retreated behind his men. Bussy gave a backstroke and a thrust. With the first he cleft open a head, with the second pierced a breast. That clears, cried he. Fly, master, cried Remy. Diana must save herself first, murmured he. Take care, cried Remy again, as four men rushed in through the door from the staircase. Bussy saw himself between two troops, but his only cry was, Ah, Diana! Then, without losing a second, he rushed on the four men, and taken by surprise, two fell, one dead, one wounded. Then, as Montsoreau advanced, he retreated again behind his rampart. "'Push the bolts and turn the key!' cried Montsoreau. "'We have him now!' During this time, by a great effort, Remy had dragged himself before Bussy and added his body to the rampart. There was an instant's pause. Bussy looked around him. Seven men lay stretched on the ground but nine remained, and seeing these nine swords, and hearing Montsoreau encouraging them, this brave man, who had never known fear, saw plainly before him the image of death, beckoning him with its gloomy smile. I may kill five more, thought he, but the other four will kill me. I have strength for ten minutes more combat, and that ten minutes let me do what man never did before. Then rushing forward, he gave three thrusts, and three times he pierced the leather of a shoulder-belt or the buff of a jacket, and three times a stream of blood followed. During this time he had parried twenty blows with his left arm, and his cloak, which he had wrapped around it, was hacked to pieces. The men changed their tactics. Seeing two of their number fall and one retire, they renounced the sword, and some tried to strike with the butt-ends of their muskets, while others fired at him with pistols. He avoided the balls by jumping from side to side or by stooping, for he seemed not only to see, hear, and act, but to divine every movement of his enemies, and appeared more than a man, or only man, because he was mortal. 
Then he thought that to kill Monsoreau would be the best way to end the combat, and sought him with his eyes among his assailants. But he stood in the background, loading the pistols for his men. However, Bussy rushed forward and found himself face to face with him. He who held a loaded pistol fired and the ball, striking Bussy's sword, broke it off six inches from the handle. "'Disarmed!' cried Monsoreau. Bussy drew back, picking up his broken blade, and in an instant it was fastened to the handle with a handkerchief, and the battle recommenced, presenting the extraordinary spectacle of a man almost without arms, but also almost without wounds, keeping six enemies at bay and with ten corpses at his feet for a rampart. When the fight began again, Monsoreau commenced to draw away the bodies, lest Bussy should snatch a sword from one of them. Bussy was surrounded, the blade of his sword bent and shook in his hand, and fatigue began to render his arm heavy, when suddenly one of the bodies, raising itself, pushed a rapier into his hand. It was Remy's last act of devotion. Bussy uttered a cry of joy and threw away his broken sword. At the same moment, Monsoreau fired at Remy, and the ball entered his brain. This time he fell to rise no more. Bussy uttered a cry. His strength seemed to return to him, and he whirled round his sword in a circle, cutting through a wrist at his right hand and laying open a cheek at his left. Exhausted by the effort, he let his right arm fall for a moment, while with his left he tried to undraw the bolts behind him. During this second he received a ball in his thigh, and two swords touched his side, but he had unfastened the bolt and turned the key. Sublime with rage, he rushed on Monsoreau and wounded him in the breast. Ah! cried Bussy. I begin to think I shall escape. The four men rushed on him, but they could not touch him, and were repulsed with blows. Monsoreau approached him twice more, and twice more was wounded. But three men seized hold of the handle of his sword and tore it from him. He seized a stool of carved wood and struck three blows with it, and knocked down two men, but it broke on the shoulder of the third, who sent his dagger into Bussy's breast. Bussy seized him by the wrist, forced the dagger from him, and stabbed him to the heart. The last man jumped out of the window. Bussy made two steps to follow him, but Monsoreau, raising himself from the floor where he was lying, wounded him in the leg with his dagger. The young man seized a sword which lay near and plunged it so vigorously into his breast that he pinned him to the floor. Ha! <laughs> ha! cried Bussy. I do not know if I shall live, but at least I shall have seen you die. Bussy dragged himself to the corridor, his wounds bleeding fearfully. He threw a last glance behind him. The moon was shining brilliantly, and its light penetrated this room, inundated with blood, and illuminated the walls, pierced by balls and hacked by blows, and lighted up the pale faces of the dead, which even then seemed to preserve the fierce look of assassins. Bussy, at the sight of this field of battle, peopled by him with slain, nearly dying as he was, experienced a feeling of pride. As he had intended, he had done what no man had done before him. There now remained to him only to fly. But all was not over for the unfortunate young man. On arriving on the staircase, he saw arms shine in the courtyard. Someone fired, and the ball pierced his shoulder. The court being guarded, he thought of the little window where Diana had said she would sit to see the combat, and as quickly as he could, he dragged himself there and locked the door behind him. Then he mounted the window with great difficulty and measured the distance with his eyes, wondering if he could jump to the other side. Oh! I shall never have the strength, cried he. But at that moment he heard steps coming up the staircase. It was the second troop mounting. He collected all his strength and made a spring, but his foot slipped and he fell on the iron spikes, which caught his clothes, and he hung suspended. He thought only of his friend. St. Luke, cried he, help, St. Luke. Ah, it is you, Monsieur de Bussy, answered a voice from behind some trees. Bussy shuddered, for it was not the voice of St. Luke. "'St. Luke!' cried he again. "'Come to me! Diana is safe! I have killed Monsoreau!' "'Ah! Monsoreau is killed!' said the same voice. "'Yes!' Then Bussy saw two men come out from behind the trees. "'Gentlemen!' cried he. "'In heaven's name, help an unfortunate nobleman, who may still escape if you aid him!' "'What do you say, Monseigneur?' said one. "'Imprudent,' said the other. "'Monseigneur!' cried Bussy, who heard the conversation. "'Deliver me, and I will pardon you for betraying me.' "'Do you hear?' said the Duke. "'What do you order?' 
that you deliver him from his sufferings, <laughs> said he with a kind of laugh. Bussy turned his head to look at the man who laughed at such a time, and at the same instant an arquebus was discharged into his breast. Cursed assassin! Oh, Diana! murmured he, and fell back dead. Is he dead? cried several men, who, after forcing the door, appeared at the windows. Yes, said Aurilly, but fly! Remember that his highness the Duc d'Anjou was the friend and protector of Monsieur de Bussy. The men instantly made off, and when the sound of their steps was lost, the duke said, Now, Aurilly, go up into the room and throw out of the window the body of Montsoreau. Aurilly obeyed, and the blood fell over the clothes of the duke, who, however, raised the coat of the dead man and drew out the paper which he had signed. This is all I wanted, said he. Now let us go. And Diana? Ma foi! I care no more for her. Untie her in St. Luke, and let them go. Aurilly disappeared. I shall not be king of France, murmured the duke, but, at all events, I shall not be beheaded for high treason. End of chapter 91 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 92 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 92 How Brother Gorenflow found himself more than ever between a gallows and an abbey. The guard placed to catch the conspirators got none of them. They all escaped, as we have seen. Therefore, when Creon at last broke open the door, he found the place deserted and empty. In vain they opened doors and windows. In vain the king cried, Chicot! No one answered. Can they have killed him? said he. Mordieu! If they have, they shall pay for it. Chicot did not reply, because he was occupied in beating Monsieur de Mayenne, which gave him so much pleasure that he neither heard nor saw what was passing. However, when the duke had disappeared, he heard and recognized the royal voice. Hear, my son, hear! cried he trying at the same time to raise Gorenflow, who, beginning to recover himself, cried, Monsieur Chicot! You are not dead, then? My good Monsieur Chicot, you will not give me up to my enemies. Wretch! Gorenflow began to howl and wring his hands. I, who have had so many good dinners with you, continued Gorenflow, I, who drank so well that you always called me the king of the sponges, I, who loved so much the capons you used to order at the corner d'Ambentance, that I never left anything but the bones. This climax appeared sublime to Chicot and determined him to clemency. Here they are, mon dieu, cried Gorenflot, vainly trying to rise. Here they come. I am lost. Oh, good monsieur Chicot, help me. And finding he could not rise, he threw himself with his face to the ground. Get up, said Chicot. Do you pardon me? We shall see. You have beaten me so much. Chicot laughed. The poor monk fancied he had received the blows given to Mayenne. You, you laugh, Monsieur Chicot? I do, animal. Then I shall live? Perhaps. You would not laugh if your Gorenflow was about to die. It does not depend upon me, but on the king. He alone has the power of life and death. At this moment lights appeared and a crowd of embroidered dresses and swords shining in the light of the torches. Ah, Chicot, my dear Chicot, how glad I am to see you, cried the king. You hear, good Monsieur Chicot, whispered Gorenflow. This great prince is glad to see you. Well? Well, in happiness he would not refuse you a favor. Ask for my pardon. What? From Herod? Oh, silence, dear Monsieur Chicot. Well, sire, how many have you caught? said Chicot, advancing. Confiture, said Gorenflow. Not one, said Crillon. The traitors must have found some opening unknown to us. It is probable. 
But you saw them, said the king. All. You recognize them, no doubt? No, sire. Not recognize them? That is to say, I recognized only one. Who was that? Monsieur de Mayenne. Monsieur de Mayenne, to whom you owed? Yes, sire. We are quits. Ah! Tell me about that, Chicot. Afterwards, my son, now let us think of the present. Confidior, replied Gorenflot. Ah, you have made a prisoner, said Creon, laying his large hand on the monk's shoulder. Chicot was silent for a minute, leaving Gorenflot a prey to all the anguish of such profound terror that he nearly fainted again. At last Chicot said, Sire, look well at this monk. The preacher Gorenflot, cried Henry. Confitior, confitior, repeated he. Himself, said Chicot. He who... Just so, interrupted Chicot. Ah, hm. Gorenflot shook with terror, for he heard the sounds of swords clashing. Wait, said Chicot. The king must know all. And taking him aside, my son, said he, thank god for having permitted this holy man to be born thirty-five years ago for it was he who saved us all how so it was he who recounted to me the whole plot from the alpha to the omega when about a week ago so that if ever your majesty's enemies catch him he will be a dead man gorenflot heard only the last words a dead man and he covered his face with his hands. "'Worthy man,' said the king, casting a benevolent look on the mass of flesh before him, "'we will cover him with our protection.' Gorenflot perceived the nature of the look and began to feel relieved. "'You will do well, my king,' said Chicot. "'What must we do with him?' "'I think that as long as he remains in Paris he will be in danger.' "'If I gave him guards?' Gorenflot heard this proposition of Henry's. Well, thought he, I shall get off with imprisonment. I prefer that to the beating, if they only feed me well. Oh, no, that is needless, said Chicot, if you will allow me to take him with me. Where? Home. Well, take him and then return to the Louvre. Get up, reverend father, said Chicot. He mocks me, murmured Gorenflot. Get up, brute, whispered Chicot, giving him a sly kick. Ah, oh, I have deserved it, cried Gorenflot. What does he say? asked the king. Sire, he is thinking over all his fatigues and his tortures, and when I promised him your protection he said, Oh, I have well merited that. Poor devil, said the king. Take good care of him. Oh, be easy, sire, he will want for nothing with me. Oh, Monsieur Chicot, dear Monsieur Chicot, cried Gorenflot, where am I to be taken? You will know soon. Meanwhile, monster of iniquity, thank his majesty. What for? Thank him, I tell you. S sire, stammered Gorenflot, since your gracious majesty... Yes, interrupted Henry, I know all you did for me in your journey from Lyon on the evening of the League, and again today. Be easy, you shall be recompensed according to your merits. Gorenflot sighed. Where is Pernerga? said Chicot. In the stable, poor beast. Well, go and fetch him and return to me. Yes, Monsieur Chicot. And the monk went away as fast as he could, much astonished not to be followed by guards. Now, my son, said Chicot, keep twenty men for your own escort, and send ten with Monsieur Crillon to the Hotel d'Anjou, and let them bring your brother here. Why? That he may not escape a second time. Did my brother... Have you repented following my advice today? No, par la mordieu. Then do what I tell you. Henry gave the order to Crillon, who set off at once. And you, said Henry, oh, I am waiting for my saint. 
and you will rejoin me at the Louvre. In an hour, go, my son. Henry went, and Chicot, proceeding to the stables, met Gorenflot coming out on his ass. The poor devil had not an idea of endeavoring to escape from the fate that he thought awaited him. Come, come, said Chicot, we are waited for. Gorenflot made no resistance, but he shed many tears. End of chapter 92 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 93 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 93 Where Chicot Guesses Why D'Epernon Had Blood on His Feet and None in His Cheeks the king, returning to the Louvre, found his friends peacefully asleep, except D'Epernon, whose bed was empty. Hmm, "'Not come in yet. How imprudent!' murmured the king to Chicot, who had also returned and was standing with them by the beds. "'The fool, having to fight tomorrow with a man like Bussy, and to take no more care than this. Let them seek, Monsieur D'Epernon,' said he, going out of the room and speaking to an usher." "'Monsieur d'Epernon is just coming in, sire,' replied the man. Indeed, d'Epernon came softly along, thinking to glide unperceived to his room. On seeing the king, he looked confused. "'Ah, here you are at last,' said Henry. "'Come here and look at your friends. They are wise. They understand the importance of the duel tomorrow. But you, instead of praying and sleeping like them, have been running about the streets. Corbleu! How pale you are!' What will you look like tomorrow? D'Epernon was indeed pale, but at the king's remark he colored. Now go to bed, continued Henry, and sleep if you can. Why not? Much time you will have. You are to fight at daybreak, and at this time of year the sun rises at four. It is now two. You have but two hours to sleep. Two hours well employed to go a long way. You will sleep then? Well, sire. I do not believe it. Why not? Because you are agitated. You think of tomorrow? I will sleep, sire, if your majesty will only let me. That is just, said Chicot. Indeed, D'Epernon undressed and got into bed with a calm and satisfied look that seemed both to the king and Chicot to augur well. He is as brave as Caesar, said the king. So brave that I do not understand it, said Chicot. See, he sleeps already. Chicot approached the bed to look. Oh, said he. What is it? Look, and he pointed to D'Epernon's boots. Blood. He has been walking in blood. Can he be wounded? said the king anxiously. Bah, he would have told us. And besides, unless he had been wounded like Achilles in the heel. See, the sleeve of his doublet is also spotted. What could have happened to him? Perhaps he has killed someone to keep his hand in. It is singular. Well, tomorrow at least. But today, you mean? Well, today I shall be tranquil. Why so? Because those cursed Angevins will be killed. You think so, Henry? I am sure of it. My friends are brave. I never heard that the Angevins were cowards. No, doubtless, but my friends are so strong. Look at Schomberg's arm. What a muscle! Ah, if you saw Antrogues, is that all that reassures you? No, come, and I will show you something. Where? In my room. And this something makes you confident of victory? Yes. Oh, come, then. Wait, and let me take leave of them. Adieu, my good friends, murmured the king, as he stooped and imprinted a light kiss on each of their foreheads. Chicot was not superstitious, but as he looked on, his imagination pictured a living man making his adieu to the dead. It is singular, thought he. I never felt so before. Poor fellows. As soon as the king quitted the room, D'Epernon opened his eyes and, jumping out of bed, began to efface, as well as he could, the spots of blood on his clothes. Then he went to bed again. As for Henry, he conducted Chicot to his room and opened a long ebony coffer lined with white satin. Look, 
said he. Swords? Yes, but blessed swords, my dear friend. Blessed by whom? By our Holy Father the Pope, who granted me this favor to send this box to Rome and back cost me twenty horses and four men. Are they sharp? Doubtless, but their great merit is that they are blessed. Yes, I know that, but still I should like to be sure they are sharp. Pagan! Let us talk of something else. Well, be quick. You want to sleep? No, to pray. In that case, we will talk. Have you sent for Monsieur d'Anjou? Yes, he is waiting below. What are you going to do to him? Throw him in the Bastille. That is very wise. Only choose a dungeon that is deep and safe. Such, for example, as those which were occupied by the Constable de St. Paul or Armagnac. Oh, be easy. I know where they sell good black velvet, my son. Chico, he is my brother. Ah, true. The family mourning is violet. Shall you speak to him? Yes, certainly, if only to show him that his plots are discovered. Huh. Do you disapprove? In your place I should cut short the conversation and uh, double the imprisonment. Let them bring here the Duc d'Anjou, said the king. A minute after the duke entered, very pale and disarmed. Crillon followed him. Where did you find him? asked the king. Sire, his highness was not at home, but I took possession of his hotel in the king's name, and soon after he returned and we arrested him without resistance. That is fortunate. Then turning to the prince, he said, Where were you, monsieur? Wherever I was, sire, be sure it was on your business. I doubt it. Francois bowed. Come, tell me where you were while your accomplices were being arrested. My accomplices? Yes, your accomplices. Sire, your majesty is making some mistake. Oh, this time you shall not escape me. Your measure of crime is full. Sire, be moderate. There is certainly someone who slanders me to you. Wretch! You shall die of hunger in a cell of the Bastille. I bow to your orders, whatever they may be. Hypocrite! But where were you? Sire, I was serving your majesty and working for the glory and tranquility of your reign. Really? Your audacity is great. Bah! said Chicot. Tell us about it, my prince. It must be curious. Sire, I would tell your majesty, had you treated me as a brother, but as you have treated me as a criminal, I will let the event speak for itself. Then bowing profoundly to the king, he turned to Creon and the other officers and said, Now, which of you gentlemen will conduct the first prince of the blood to the Bastille? Chicot had been reflecting, and a thought struck him. Ah, murmured he, I believe I guess now why Monsieur de Bernon had so much blood on his feet and so little in his cheeks. End of chapter 93. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 94 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 94 The Morning of the Combat The king did not sleep all night, and very early in the morning he set off, accompanied by Chicot, to examine the ground where the combat was to take place. Quellus will be exposed to the sun, said he. He will have it at his right, just in his only eye, whereas Mauguron, who has good eyes, will be in the shade. That is badly managed. As for Schomberg, his place is good, but Quellus, my poor Quellus. Do not torment yourself so, my king. It is useless. And Depernon. I am really unjust not to think of him, he who is to fight Bussy. Look at his place, Chicot. 
He who will have to give way constantly for Bussy is like a tiger. He has a tree on his right and a ditch on his left. Bah, said Chicot, I am not concerned about Depernon. You are wrong. He will be killed. Not he. Be sure he has taken precautions. How so? He will not fight. Did you not hear what he said before going to bed? That is just why I think he will not fight. Incredulous and distrustful. I know my Gascon, Henry, but if you will take my advice, you will return to the Louvre. Do you think I can stay there during the combat? I do not wish you not to love your friends, but I do wish you not to leave Monsieur d'Anjou alone at the Louvre. Is not Creon there? Creon is only a buffalo, a, a rhinoceros, a wild boar, while your brother is the serpent, whose strength lies in his cunning. You are right. I should have sent him to the Bastille. When Chicot and the king entered, the young men were being dressed by their valets. Good morning, gentlemen, said he. I find you all in good spirits, I hope. Yes, sire, said Quellus. You look gloomy, Maugiron. Sire, I am superstitious, and I had bad dreams last night, so I am drinking a little wine to keep up my spirits. My friend, remember that dreams are the impressions of the previous day, and have no influence on the morrow. Yes, sire, said Depernon, I also had bad dreams last night, but in spite of that, my hand is steady and fit for action. Yes, said Chicot. You dreamed you had blood on your boots, and that is not a bad dream, for it signifies that you will be a conqueror, like Alexander or Caesar. My friends, said Henry, remember you fight only for honor. The past night has seated me firmly on my throne. Therefore, do not think of me, and above all things, no false bravery. You wish to kill your enemies, not to die yourselves." The gentlemen were now ready, and it only remained to take leave of their master. "'Do you go on horseback?' asked he. "'No, sire, on foot.' They each kissed his hand, and Depernon said, "'Sire, bless my sword.' "'Not so, Depernon. Give up your sword. I have a better one for each of you. Chicot, bring them here.' "'No, sire. Send your captain of the guards.' I am but a pagan, and they might lose their virtue by coming through my hands. What are these swords, sire? said Schomberg. Italian swords, my son, forged at Milan. Thanks, sire. Now go, it is time, said the king, who could hardly control his emotion. Sire, said Quellus, shall we not have your majesty's presence to encourage us? No, that would not be right. You will be supposed to fight without any one being cognizant of it, and without my sanction. Let it appear to be the result of a private quarrel. When they were gone, the king threw himself down in tears. Now, said Chicot, I will go to see this duel, for I have an idea that something curious will happen with regard to Depernon. And he went off. Henry shut himself up in his room, first saying to Creon, who knew what was to take place. If we are conquerors, Creon, come and tell me. If not, strike three blows on the door. End of chapter 94 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 95 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 95. The Friends of Bussy. The friends of the Duc d'Anjou had passed as good and tranquil a night as those of the king, although their master had not taken the same care of them. After a good supper, they had all retired to sleep at Antrogues' house, which was nearest to the field of battle. Antrogues, before supper, had gone to take leave of a little milliner whom he adored. Ribérac had written to his mother, and Livoreau had made his will. They were up early in the morning and dressed themselves in red breeches and socks, that their enemies might not see their blood, and they had doublets of grey silk. They wore shoes without heels, and their pages carried their swords, that their arms might not be fatigued. The weather was splendid, for love, war, or walking, 
and the sun gilded the roofs on which the night dew was sparkling. The streets were dry and the air delightful. Before leaving the house, the young men had sent to the Hotel d'Anjou to inquire for Bussy, and had received a reply that he had gone out the evening before and had not yet returned. "'Oh,' said Antrogues, "'I know where he is. The king ordered a grand chase at Campiegne, and Monsieur de Montsoreau was to set off yesterday. It is all right, gentlemen. He is nearer the ground than we are, and may be there before us. We will call for him in passing.' The streets were empty as they went along. No one was to be seen except peasants coming from Montreuil or Vincennes with milk or vegetables. The young men went on in silence until they reached the Rue Saint Antoine. Then, with a smile, they glanced at Montsoreau's house. One could see well from there, and I am sure poor Diana will be more than once at the window, said Antrogues. I think she must be there already, said Ribarac, for the window is open true but what can be the meaning of that ladder before it it is odd we are not the only ones to wonder said Livarot. see those peasants who are stopping their carts to look the young men arrived under the balcony monsieur de montsoreau they cried do you intend to present at our combat if so be quick for we wish to arrive first they waited but no one answered did you put up that ladder asked Antrogues of a man who was examining the ground. "'God forbid!' replied he. "'Why so? Look up!' "'Blood!' cried Riverac. "'The door has been forced,' said Antrogues, and seizing the ladder, he was on the balcony in a moment. "'What is it?' cried the others, seeing him turn pale. A terrible cry was his only answer. Levarot mounted behind him. "'Corpses!' death everywhere cried he and they both entered the room it bore horrible traces of the terrible combat of the previous night a river of blood flowed over the room and the curtains were hanging in strips from sword cuts oh poor remy cried antrogues suddenly dead yes but a regiment of troopers must have passed through the room cried Livarot. Then, seeing the door of the corridor open and traces of blood indicating that one or more of the combatants had also passed through there, he followed it. Meanwhile, Antrogues went into the adjoining room. There also blood was everywhere, and this blood led to the window. He leaned out and looked into the little garden. The iron spikes still held the livid corpse of the unhappy Bussy. At this sight, it was not a cry, but a yell that Antrogues uttered. Levarot ran to see what it was, and Ribarac followed. "'Look!' said Antrogues. "'Bussy's dead! Bussy assassinated and thrown out of the window!' They ran down. "'It is he!' cried Levarot. "'His wrist is cut! He has two balls in his breast! He is full of wounds! Ah, oh, poor Bussy! We will have vengeance!' Turning round, they came against a second corpse. Montsoreau cried Livarot. What? Monsoreau also? Yes, pierced through and through. Ah, they have assassinated all our friends. And his wife, Madame de Monsoreau, cried Antrogues, but no one answered. Bussy, poor Bussy. Yes, they wish to get rid of the most formidable of us all. It is cowardly. It is infamous. We will tell the duke. No, said Antrogues, let us not charge anyone with the care of our vengeance. Look, my friends, at the noble face of the bravest of men. See his blood. That teaches that he never left his vengeance to any other person. Bussy, we will act like you, and we will avenge you. Then, drawing his sword, he dipped it in Bussy's blood. Bussy, said he, I swear on your corpse that this blood shall be washed off by the blood of your enemies. Bussy, cried the others, we swear to kill them or die. No mercy, said Antrogues, but we shall be but three. True, but we have assassinated no one, and God will strengthen the innocent. Adieu, Bussy. Adieu, Bussy, replied the others, and they went out, pale but resolute, from that cursed house around which a crowd had begun to collect. Arriving on the ground, they found their opponents waiting for them. "'Gentlemen,' said Quellus, rising and bowing, "'we have had the honor of waiting for you.' "'Excuse us,' 
said Antrogues, but we should have been here before you but for one of our companions. Monsieur de Bussy, said Depernon, I do not see him. Where is he? We can wait for him, said Schomberg. He will not come. All looked thunderstruck, but Depernon exclaimed, Ah, the brave man par excellence, is he then afraid? That cannot be, said Quellus. You are right, monsieur, said Livarot. And why will he not come? Because he is dead. Dead? cried they all, but Depernon turned rather pale. And dead because he has been assassinated, said Antrogues. Did you not know it, gentlemen? No. How should we? Besides, is it certain? Antrogues drew his sword. So certain that here is his blood, said he. Monsieur de Bussy, assassinated? His blood cries for vengeance. Do you not hear it, gentlemen? said Ripperock. What do you mean? Seek whom the crime profits, the law says, replied Ribarock. Ah, gentlemen, will you explain yourselves? cried Maugiron. That is just what we have come for. Quick, our swords are in our hands, said Depernon. Oh, you are in a great hurry, Monsieur le Gascon. You did not crow so loud when we were four against four. Is it our fault, if you are only three? Yes, it is your fault. He is dead because you preferred him lying in his blood to standing here. He is dead with his wrist cut, that that wrist may no longer hold a sword. He is dead that you might not see the lightning of those eyes which dazzled you all. Do you understand me? Am I clear? Enough, gentlemen, said Quellus. Retire, Monsieur d'Epernon. We will fight three against three. These gentlemen shall see if we are men to profit by a misfortune which we deplore as much as themselves. Come, gentlemen, added the young Maul, throwing his hat behind him and raising his left hand while he whirled his sword with his right. God is our judge if we are assassins. Ah, I hated you before, cried Schomberg, and now I execrate you. On your guard, gentlemen, cried Antrogues. With doublets or without, said Schomberg. Without doublets, without shirts, our breasts bare, our hearts uncovered. The young men threw off their doublets and shirts. I have lost my dagger, said Quellus. It must have fallen on the road. Or else you left it at Monsieur de Montsoreau's in the Place de la Bastille, said Antrogues. Quellus gave a cry of rage and drew his sword. But he has no dagger, Monsieur Antrogues, cried Chicot, who had just arrived. So much the worse for him. It is not my fault, said Antrogues. End of chapter 95 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 96 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 96 The Combat the place where this terrible combat was to take place was sequestered and shaded by trees. It was generally frequented only by children who came to play there during the day, or by drunkards or robbers who made a sleeping place of it by night. Chicot, his heart palpitating, although he was not of a very tender nature, seated himself before the lackeys and pages on a wooden balustrade. He did not love the Angevans and detested the minions. But they were all young, brave men, and in their veins flowed a generous blood, which he was probably destined to see flow before long. D'Epernon made a last bravado. "'What? You all are afraid of me?' he cried. "'Hold your tongue,' said Antrogues. "'Come away, bravest of the brave,' said Chicot, "'or else you will lose another pair of shoes.' "'What do you mean?' I mean that there will be soon blood on the ground, and that you will walk in it as you did last night. D'Epernon became deadly pale, and moving away, he seated himself at some distance from Chicot. Combat began as five o'clock struck, and for a few minutes nothing was heard but the clashing of swords. Not a blow was struck. At last Schomberg touched Riverac in the shoulder, and the blood gushed out. 
Schomberg tried to repeat the blow, but Ribarac stuck up his sword and wounded him in the side. "'Now let us rest a few seconds if you like,' said Ribarac. Quellus, having no dagger, was at a great disadvantage, for he was obliged to parry with his left arm, and as it was bare on each occasion it cost him a wound. His hand was soon bleeding in several places, and Antrog had also wounded him in the breast. But at each wound he repeated, "'It is nothing!' Livoreau and Maugiron were still unwounded. Ribarac and Schomberg recommenced. The former was pierced through the breast, and Schomberg was wounded in the neck. Ribarac was mortally wounded, and Schomberg rushed on him and gave him another. But he, with his right hand, seized his opponents, and with his left, plunged his dagger into his heart. Schomberg fell back, dragging Ribarac with him. Livoreau ran to aid Ribarac to disengage himself from the grasp of his adversary, but was closely pursued by Maugiron who cut open his head with a blow of his sword. Livoreau let his sword drop and fell on his knees. Then Maugiron hastened to give him another wound, and he fell altogether. Quellus and Maugiron remained against Antrog. Quellus was bleeding, but from slight wounds. Antrogs comprehended his danger. He had not the least wound, but he began to feel tired, so he pushed aside Quellus's sword and jumped over a barrier. But at the same moment, Maugiron attacked him behind. Antrogs turned, and Quellus profited by this movement to get under the barrier. "'He is lost,' thought Chicot. "'Vive le roi!' cried d'Epernon. "'Silence, if you please, monsieur,' said Antrog. At this instant, Livarot, of whom no one was thinking, rose on his knees, hideous from the blood with which he was covered, and plunged his dagger between the shoulders of Maugiron, who fell, crying out, "'Mon Dieu! I am killed!' Livaro fell back again, fainting. "'Monsieur de Quellus,' said Antrog, "'you are a brave man. Yield, I offer you your life.' "'And why yield?' "'You are wounded, and I am not.' "'Vive le roi!' cried Quellus. "'I have still my sword.' And he rushed on Antrog, who parried the thrust, and seizing his arm, wrested his sword from him, saying, "'Now you have it no longer.' "'Ah! Oh, a sword!' cried Quellus and bounding like a tiger on Antrog, he threw his arms round him. Antrog stuck him with his dagger again and again, but Quellus managed to seize his hands and twisted round him like a serpent, with arms and legs. Antrog, nearly suffocated, reeled and fell, but on the unfortunate Quellus. He managed to disengage himself, for Quellus's powers were failing him, and leaning on one arm gave him a last blow. "'Vive la r-! said Quellus, and that was all. The silence and terror of death reigned everywhere. Antrogues rose, covered with blood, but it was that of his enemy. D'Epernon made the sign of the cross and fled as if he were pursued by demons. Chicot ran and raised Quellus, whose blood was pouring out from nineteen wounds. The movement roused him, and he opened his eyes. Antrogues, said he, "'On my honor, I am innocent of the death of Bussy. "'Oh!' "'I believe you, monsieur,' cried Antrog, much moved. "'Fly!' murmured Quellus. "'The king will never forgive you. "'I cannot abandon you thus, even to escape the scaffold.' "'Save yourself, young man,' said Chicot. "'Do not tempt Providence twice in one day.' Antrog approached Riverrock, who still breathed. "'Well?' asked he. "'We are victors.' said Antrogs in a low tone, not to offend Quellus. "'Thanks,' said Ribarac. "'Now go!' And he fainted again. Antrogs picked up his own sword, which he had dropped, then that of Quellus, which he presented to him. A tear shone in the eyes of the dying man. "'We might have been friends,' he murmured. "'Now fly,' said Chicot. "'You are worthy of being saved.' "'And my companions?' I will take care of them, as of the king's friends. Antrogs wrapped himself in a cloak which his squire handed to him, so that no one might see the blood with which he was covered, and leaving the dead and wounded, he disappeared through the port St. Antoine. End of chapter 96 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 97 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 97. 
The End the king, pale with anxiety and shuddering at the slightest noise, employed himself in conjecturing, with the experience of a practiced man, the time that it would take for the antagonists to meet and that the combat would last. Now, he murmured first, they are crossing the Rue Saint Antoine. Now they are entering the field. Now they have begun. And at these words, the poor king, trembling, began to pray. Rising again in a few minutes, he cried, if Quellus only remembers the thrust I taught him. As for Schomberg, he is so cool that he is he ought to kill Ribarac. Uh, Maugiron also should be more than a match for Livarot. But Depernon, he is lost. Fortunately, he is the one of the four whom I love least. But if Bussy, the terrible Bussy, after killing him, falls on the others. Oh, my poor friends. Sire, said Creon at the door, what already sire i have no news but that the duc d'anjou begs to speak to your majesty what for he says that the moment has come for him to tell you what service he rendered your majesty and that what he has to tell you will calm a part of your fears well let him come at this moment they heard a voice crying i must speak to the king at once the king recognized the voice and opened the door. "'Here? St. Luke!' cried he. "'What is it? But, mon Dieu, what is the matter? Are they dead?' Indeed, St. Luke, pale, without hat or sword, and spotted with blood, rushed into the king's room. "'Sire!' cried he. "'Vengeance! I ask for vengeance!' "'My poor St. Luke, what is it? You seem in despair.' "'Sire, one of your subjects!' the bravest noblest has been murdered this night traitorously murdered of whom do you speak sire you do not love him i know but he was faithful and if need were would have shed all his blood for your majesty else he would not have been my friend ah said the king who began to understand and something like a gleam of joy passed over his face vengeance sire for monsieur de Bussy. Monsieur de Bussy? Yes, Monsieur de Bussy, whom twenty assassins poniarded last night. He killed fourteen of them. Monsieur de Bussy? Dead? Yes, sire. Then he does not fight this morning? St. Luc cast a reproachful glance on the king, who turned away his head and in doing so saw Creon still standing at the door. He signed to him to bring in the duke. No, sire. He will not fight, said St. Luke, and that is why I ask, not for vengeance. I was wrong to call it so, but for justice. I love my king and am, above all things, jealous of his honor, and I think that it is a deplorable service which they have rendered to your majesty by killing Monsieur de Bussy. The Duc d'Anjou had just entered, and St. Luke's words had enlightened the king as to the service his brother had boasted of having rendered him. Do you know what they will say? continued St. Luke. They will say, if your friends conquer, that it is because they first murdered Bussy. And who will dare to say that? Pardieu, everyone, said Creon. No, monsieur, they shall not say that, replied the king, for you shall point out the assassin. I will name him, sire, to clear your majesty from so heinous an accusation, said St. Luke. Well, do it. The Duc d'Anjou stood quietly by. Sire, continued St. Luke, last night they laid a snare for Bussy while he visited a woman whom loved him. The husband, warned by a traitor, came to his house with a troop of assassins. They were everywhere in the street, in the courtyard, even in the garden. In spite of his power over himself, the Duke grew pale at these last words. Bussy fought like a lion, sire, but numbers overwhelmed him, and— And he was killed, interrupted the king, and justly. I will certainly not revenge an adulterer. Sire, I have not finished my tale. The unhappy man, after having defended himself for more than half an hour in the room, after having triumphed over his enemies, escaped, bleeding, wounded, and mutilated— he only wanted someone to lend him a saving hand, which I would have done, 
had I not been seized by his assassins and bound and gagged. Unfortunately, they forgot to take away my sight as well as my speech, for I saw two men approach the unlucky Bussy, who was hanging on the iron railings. I heard him entreat them for help, for in these two men he had the right to reckon on two friends. Well, sire, it is horrible to relate. It was still more horrible to see and hear. One ordered him to be shot, and the other obeyed. "'And you know the assassins?' cried the king, moved in spite of himself. "'Yes,' said St. Luke, and turning to the prince with an expression of intense hatred, he cried, "'The assassin, sire, was the prince, his friend!' The duke stood perfectly quiet and answered, "'Yes, Monsieur de St. Luke is right. It was I, and your majesty will appreciate my action, for Monsieur de Bussy was my servant, but this morning he was to fight against your majesty. "'You lie, assassin!' cried St. Luc. "'Bussy, full of wounds, his hands cut to pieces, a ball through his shoulder and hanging suspended on the iron trellis work, might have inspired pity in the most cruel enemies. They would have succored him. But you, the murderer of La Mole and of Coquenard, you killed Bussy, as you have killed one after another, all of your friends.' You killed Bussy not because he was the king's enemy, but because he was the confidant of your secrets. Ah, Monsoreau knew well your reason for this crime. Cordieu, cried Creon, why am I not king? They insult me before you, brother, said the duke, pale with terror. Leave us, Creon, said the king. The officer obeyed. Justice, sire, justice cried St. Luke again. Sire, said the duke, will you punish me for having served your majesty's friends this morning? And I, cried St. Luke, I say that the cause which you espouse has accursed, and will be pursued by the anger of God. Sire, when your brother protects our friends, woe to them. The king shuddered. Then they heard hasty steps and voices, followed by a deep silence, and then, as if a voice from heaven came to confirm St. Luke's words, three blows were struck slowly and solemnly on the door by the vigorous arm of Creon. Henry turned deadly pale. "'Conquered!' cried he. "'My poor friends!' "'What did I tell you, sire?' cried St. Luke. "'See how the murder succeeds!' But the king saw nothing, heard nothing. He buried his face in his hands and murmured, Oh, my poor friends, who will tell me about them? I, sire, said Chicot. Well, cried Henry, two are dead, and the third is dying. Which is the third? Quellus. Where is he? At the Hotel Boissy. The king said no more, but rushed from the room. St. Luke had taken Diana home to his wife, and this had kept him from appearing sooner at the Louvre. Jean passed three days and nights watching her through the most frightful delirium. On the fourth day, Jean, overcome by fatigue, went to take a little rest. Two hours after, when she returned, Diana was gone. Quellus died at the Hotel Boissy in the King's arms after lingering for thirty days. Henry was inconsolable. He raised three magnificent tombs for his friends, on which their effigies were sculptured, life-size in marble. He had innumerable masses said for them, and prayed for their souls himself night and morning. For three months Chicot never left his master. In September Chicot received the following letter, dated from the priory of Boima. Dear Chicot, the air is soft in this place, and the vintage promises to be good this year. They say that the king, whose life I saved, still grieves much. Bring him to the priory. Dear Monsieur Chicot, we will give him wine of 1550, which I have discovered in my cellar, and which is enough to make one forget the greatest grief. For I find in the holy writ these words, Good wine rejoices the heart of man. It is in Latin. I will show it to you. Come, then, dear Monsieur Chicot, come with the king, Monsieur de Pernon, and Monsieur de St. Luc, and we will fatten them all. The Reverend Prior, Dom Gornflow, your humble servant and friend. P.S. 
tell the king that I have not yet had time to pray for the souls of his friends, but when the vintage is over, I shall not fail to do so. Amen, said Chicot. Here are poor devils well recommended to heaven. The end of chapter 97 The end of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas